<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome back for our third talk of this Rutgers Geology Museum annual open house. I'm really pleased to say our next talk is going to be about why Mary Anning rocks. Uh, it's by Anya Pearson, who is a trustee of the Mary Anning Rocks Project. And that's a charity dedicated to recognition of the famous paleontologist and fossil collector, Mary Anning. Anya is a fashion professional and businesswoman who began the Mary Anning Rocks Project. The inspiration for this project came from her daughter, who after collecting fossils at one of the local sites where Mary used to collect, noticed that there was no statue in her honor. The goal of the project is to build a monument in honor of Mary Anning so that she can better serve as a role model to all children proving that gender and class should never stop someone from achieving their dreams. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this. I'm going to stop sharing. I see you're on, Anya, so you can begin your talk. And Thank welcome. you. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Right, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, present mode. How does that look? Is that working for everyone? Yes. That was perfect. Yes. Great. Brilliant. Okay. So um, huge thanks for inviting me um, and welcome to the world of Mariani Rocks. Um, it's a statue primarily, um, but it, four years in the making, we've actually uh, got a second part to the charity, which is going to be the learning legacy, which will be a sustainable part of the um, charity that will live, live, live on after the statue is raised. Um, and just um, wanted to say a big thank you really for asking me because um, a couple of things, it's always nice to talk uh, to like-minded people on uh, the other side of the pond. Uh, we've got quite a lot of followers actually um, in the States that have, follow have been following us since um, day, day dot. Um, and you guys are as crazy for Mary as we are, which is great to know. Um, and also equally, I do a lot of these talks to people that don't necessarily understand or know who Mary is. So although I'll give you a little potted history, I'm not just gonna launch into why, you know, why Mary rocks. Um, I'll give you a little potted history about her as well. And hopefully a little bit more of an insight into some of the lesser known things about Mary's life. Um, but it's just really nice to talk to like-minded people who kind of, who, who, you know, who know geology and, you know, get why she's so significant. So thank you for inviting me. Um, and as my introduction said, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I am a, a, an absolute fan of Mary. So I do know a lot about Mary's life. So hopefully um, when we do a Q&A at the end, if there's anything too technical, technical, please, you know, spare me because I'm a fashion designer. So I, I know very little about ologies. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that'd be great. So I'll kick off. So what I'll do is um, Mary Anning um, was born at a time um, when the Napoleonic Wars were going on um, and there was quite a lot of starvation and there were not, not a lot of food going around. So it meant that lots of people in the kind of um, working class people, there was a lot of movement and, and people moving from towns to town. So actually Mary's parents weren't from um, Lyme Regis and they gravita gravitated to Lyme Regis, in fact, because they were um, what we call religious dissenters. So these were a religious group that broke away from um, Christianity. Um, and I think the one fundament fundamental thing about um, dissenters were that one of the biggest things um, that they did in their teachings was to always question everything. And I think when you look at Mary's life and how absolutely amazing she was, it kind of fits that she was brought up with this um, religious belief that you should question everything and it was all about learning and that there were Sunday schools and everybody was um, had a right to have some form of education. So I think that's where um, a lot of her sort of acquisitive mind came from. Um, but she was um, this fantastic, I'm just gonna drop this out of the way because it's actually um, covering up my slides. Um, so she was born in um, 1799. So that's, that's around about sort of the height of the Georgian period really. And her life kind of spanned through the Victorian era. Um, but I think one of the most fascinating things about her was she was just 11 years old when she discovered one of the first ever fossilized remains of long extinct animals. Um, and in that one moment, she just changed the way that we view the world for good. And I just find her whole story really, really fascinating. Um, and and, and, and it angers me and it's so annoying that she's not riddled through all of our history books and that she's not the centre of attention when it comes to talking about the history of the earth and um, evolution and things like that. So um, 
for me, it's a quite a, a passionate journey to put her voice back into that conversation. Um, so Mary was one of 10 children. Um, the, the, as it was in those days, uh, child mortality was really high. And out of the 10 children that Mary's parents had, it was only herself and her older brother, Joseph, that actually survived into adulthood. Um, and she basically learned her skills um, from her father. So her father had got into fossil collecting as a sideline because he was a, a carpenter. Um, and they called them curios, these fossils that they found, and they would sell them to tourists. But his speciality was that he was able to, with his um, carpentry skills, was able to prepare these fossils um, and then mount them in some really beautiful wooden cases. And it kind of made them more sellable in a way. So that kind of combination of uh, being able to prep, find fossils, prep fossils, and then mount them beautifully was something like the, the Anning family had, and that's how they became um, the business started really. Um, and as I said earlier, one of the first uh, marine reptiles that Mary discovered when she was 11 years old with her brother um, Joseph was um, an ichthyosaur. And no one had ever seen anything like this at all. You know, people thought they were sea dragons or dragons full stop, you know, these mythical creatures. Um, and it really did turn uh, geology and the way that people looked at the earth on its head, you know, because up until that point, the Bible told us that, you know, the, what was it, the earth was 6,000 years old, but, you know, clearly this, uh, Mary and her brother had found this skeleton of something that had turned to stone and, you know, and that, and that would have taken hundreds and thousands and millions of years. So um, absolutely turned everything on its head. I think the most fascinating thing for me about Mary is that she not only discovered these amazing things, so this is just an image of what it would look, um, an artist's impression of what an ichthyosaur would look like in, in flesh and blood. Um, uh, and this is some of the food that they would have eaten. They would have eaten um, fish at the time and ammonites. But one of the fascinating things about Mary um, that intrigues me is that she not only did she find these incredible fossilized remains in the rocks, but she had the intelligence to do the kind of research um, you know, and really look into uh, the, the fossils. And she was the one that discovered actually that they um, were, gave life to, um, they gave birth to live young um, and that they ate their own young, you know? So there was this, you know, she could see that in the, uh, in, in the bowels and in the wombs of fossilized remains that she would find, you know? So it's, she was this very, very inquiring mind that she had. Um, but for me, I think that the one of the biggest discoveries, it's one of the ones that people don't talk about quite, a lot and I, and I think it's because it is poo basically at the end of the day is that she was the one that kind of discovered coprolites and actually realized what they were um so these stones um that you, they used to sell as curiosities to tourists she suddenly realized one day because she saw uh, these these fossilized um coprolites inside um, the bowel region of one of the animals and it suddenly dawned on her well this is what this is this is this is marine reptile poo um, and again, what that did was it kind of opened up a whole new window for her to then understand what they were eating. And that's how she knew that they were eating their own young and that they were eating fish because of the fish scales. And um, so just really, really interesting. In fact, um, coprolites is one of my favourite fossils and I've got several of them. And I think of, uh, there's of the, the comedy side of it's quite good because well. kids love them because when you tell them that they're holding a 200 year old piece of poo in their hands, they, they quite enjoy that. But I just find them fascinating in their own right that these like little capsules of, of information um, that tell you so much more about the animals um, bones and remains so yeah coprolite's discovery for me was one of her, her top um, kind of discoveries um, she also um, found the the, the full uh, plesiosaur as well which is another marine um, reptile um, this actual one is in the Natural History Museum. I know it's got a picture of her next to it. Lots of people get confused. It's actually not one of the ones that she found. So lots of people get a bit upset about that. So I think the museum's probably going to have to um, change that picture. But that is on the Anning Wall in the Natural History Museum. So anybody that's um, been lucky enough to go to London to the Natural History Museum, um, a lot of the specimens in that cabinet um, are Mary's, not, not this particular one, but it's just a great example to show you of a, of a of quite a large plesiosaur. I think this one was discovered um, up in, in, in Leicestershire around that area. Um, and again, plesiosaurs, these are artists' impressions of how they think they, they may have looked. Um, and again, they, they predated on, on fish and ammonites. And again, we can tell that from their poo, from the coprolites um, that were, were found 
um, that they still can be found. Um, quite, uh, you won't want to meet one of these on a dark night. I think they're quite, they're out of a, out of a, 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 a ichthyosaur and a plesiosaur. Plesiosaur is definitely one I wouldn't want to meet on a, in a dark alley on a dark night. Very scary. But, you know, huge predators. Um, and then I, I wanted to put this um, slide in because um, this is one of our patrons. This is Dr. Um, Dean Lomax. And he um, recently discovered, they've, they've called it the Rutland Sea Dragon. Um, and it's actually now officially the largest uh, ichthyosaur ever discovered in the UK at over 10 metres long. Um, and it only broke recently. I and mean, if, you, if you Google it, you can read all sorts of articles about it, but absolutely fascinating. Um, this particular um, fossil wasn't found along the Jurassic coast. Um, this was found up in Rutland um, in because the, uh, the Lias um, band of fossilific um, material it isn't just along the coastline um, at, uh, the, in the Jurassic coast in England. It's a call that actually runs right the way from the south of England all the way through the centre of England and pops out at the top in Yorkshire. And, and I know probably English geography is not, not, your, not probably something that you um, are, are very kind of au fait with. So I've just quickly dropped some maps in here just so you can get your head around what I'm talking about. So this map here is just to give you a a sort of a, a, a bird's eye view of the UK as a whole so you can get your bearings and then the map next to it is actually showing you the Lias group outcrop which if you look down you've got Charmouth and Bridport and it goes through Yeovil and then this red line goes through the Mendip Hills right across the country through Rugby and Leicester um, and the Rutland Dragon was found around this Leicester area um, in a reservoir. And then it goes all the way up into Yorkshire and comes out at Whitby and, and Redcar. So all these places, um, especially in Whitby and Redcar and Charmouth and Lyme Regis on the coast where the, the coastal erosion exposes fossils are absolutely brilliant to find um, Jurassic um, uh, marine reptiles. So yeah, so lots of um, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs being discovered. Um, but the other thing also that she is really kind of um, um, well known for is that she discovered the first ever um, uh, pterodactyl uh, discovery, um, and this was it. So this, and, and this also blows my mind away. So we've got to remember as well, so she was a, a working class woman that wasn't educated, but she was able to look at this jumble of bones and immediately know that this was something that she'd never ever seen before, and that it was some kind of flying creature. Um, and what I love about this image as well, just to point out and, and kind of uh, illustrating what I said earlier about uh, the cabinet maker, this is actually one of the original frames made by the Anning family. And this is how they would present and, and sell them to fossil collectors. So it's a bit of a double whammy picture, this showing how she would beautifully prep and prepare her fossils and then mount them in these really great wooden kind of um, display cases. Um, so yeah, so this was the first ever um, um, uh, pterosaurs, um, and obviously later on we called them pterodactyls, that was found um, in the UK, these little flying mammals. So she's got this real back catalogue of these absolutely amazing finds that, that she found. Um, but the other thing as well that, uh, that a lot of people don't know about is that because she was a woman and because she wasn't um, educated, she was self-educated, she taught herself to read and write, um, and that she was incredibly poor. She couldn't afford the uh, late to, to pay for the latest scientific papers. So she would borrow them from people in Lyme Regis. So she was very friendly with the Philpot sisters who were sort of middle to upper class ladies who uh, could afford to buy the journals and the papers. She would borrow them from um, the Philpot sisters and would then spend hours and hours laboriously copying out the texts and copying out the sketches. And she was just, this, this actual sketch on the right-hand side of um, a plesiosaur is actually her drawing. And I just think that the skill and the detail and the ability of her to be able to capture and do these incredible field drawings, um, it's, it's just absolutely fascinates me. So she was a prolific note taker and, and sketch taker. Um, and the Natural History Museum actually have got some amazing um, notebooks and sketches of hers. Um, so if you're ever in London, you have to make an appointment, but you can go along. And, and Eve, my daughter and myself have been really lucky. We spent a day in the library there just looking at all these amazing letters and sketches and notebooks that she had. And they're absolutely fascinating. Very, very distinctive handwriting, actually. Very beautiful, as you can see on the, the bottom here. 
Um, and the other really fascinating thing about Mary that I absolutely love um, is that she um, discovered that certain ink sacs, so she would find these uh, fossilized squids um, or in, in, the, in the blue lias, um, and she could reactivate the ink in the in, in, ink sacs and actually draw and paint with them. So this is a letter that she did by reactivated nearly one million, you know, nearly two million year old ink that had been fossilized all that time and drew these pictures and wrote these letters with the ink of those extinct animals. I just find that mind blowing. And I just love this letter. And again, it's very intricate, very, very clever drawing that she's done. Um, but the other thing that she did as well, which uh, it just blows my mind again, is that she would find these squids, she would find these creatures and, and these fish, these fossilised remained, and she had the whereabouts to then go down to the uh, harbour and buy cuttlefish and fish and then dissect them and then compare, you know, that she could take notes and look at one and compare it to the other. Um, and I just think that that just shows her absolute sort of tenacity and, and uh an, an ability to fully understand the things that she was, or, or attempting to understand the things that she was finding. So again, you know, it just, it's a, an absolutely amazing um, fact about Mary. So um, a little bit more about Mary. So she grew up hunting along the beaches of Charmouth and Lyme Regis, which is all now known as the Jurassic Coast. So it's a UNESCO site, and it is still the only a UNESCO site in the UK that is, is of, of natural, you know, it's it's a natural form. Um, and she was also, a, bit, a lot of people don't know, she was actually famous in her own lifetime. So when she was in her 20s, she had all these amazing people that were coming up from London and coming from overseas, from France and Germany and places like that, you know, to come and talk to her and, and, and seek her out because she, she was the expert. You know, there wasn't anybody other than Mary that knew as much about all these incredible creatures that she was discovering. Um, so she really was famous in her own lifetime, which is even more galling when you think that she's just been completely, you know, forgotten and, and taken out of history. So that's my daughter just walking, even though I told her this was a live event. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then the other thing that all, all, always kind of galls me as well is that um, I look, when I read this and started to investigate about Mary's life, um, and the penny drops and you suddenly go, oh, my God, you know, this is this is, you know, so true. You know, that Mary's early understanding of, it, of extinction really helped us all age the planet and changed how, how we view the world. And it kind of enabled others like Charles Darwin to go down the path that he went down, you know. So, you know, he stands on really big shoulders and yet you just never hear a name mentioned at all in the mix, you know. So I think that's a really important thing to um, consider. But as I said earlier, you know, Mary was three things you really didn't want to be in Victorian times, and that was poor, working class and a woman. Uh, she wasn't allowed to join any of the big clubs in London. You know, it was all these new um, clubs were opening up and, and organisations like the Geology, Geology Society and uh, all, you know, and because she was a woman, I mean, women weren't even allowed into the lecture theatres. To listen to the lectures let alone become members and uh, and then forget being published you know that's never going to happen she had nothing of her work ever published the only time she ever had anything written was when she wrote into the natural uh naturalist journal a journal like a, a magazine because somebody that she'd furnished the um the fossils to and had helped uh the to um, diagnose uh, uh, sort of discover a certain dinosaur had written absolute rubbish and she wrote in to say well actually this is all incorrect you've got it all wrong it's x y and z not y z y um and she got her letter published that's the only time she ever ever got published um so you know and it, this kind of went on you know that she her work was either plagiarized or taken her name was never mentioned you know, and all her ideas um, were taken and she was never, ever given credit. And, and this is a really interesting quote that was um, quoted in a series of letters um, from somebody called Anne Pinney, who was a friend of Mary's. Uh, and this is Anne quoting to another friend in the letter saying that, that Mary had said that the world had used her ill. These men of learning have sucked my brains and made a great deal of the publishing of works of which I furnished the contents while I derived none of the advantages. I mean, that just sums up, and you can just 
kind of get inside her head and just almost understand really the frustration. I mean, it must have been absolutely soul destroying for her, you know. So I, I think that's a really quite poignant quote. So um, Mary's kind of been lost from the conversation, you know, because she was never written into our history books. And if you're not in a history book and you're not talked about in the classroom and you're not part of the conversation, um, that, that's it. You're just forgotten in time, you know, and all her discoveries and all the things that she did have, have been lost, you know, and that's wrong. Um, so that's really why Mary Annie Rocks was born. You know, we felt like we needed to put her physically back into the landscape where she was from, where she, you know, literally and metaphorically did a groundbreaking work. Um, and then off the back of it, as I mentioned before, have the, the learning legacy that will live on as a sustainable, um, so that she's never ever forgotten again. Um, and, you know, so it's everyone can learn about the, her, this remarkable woman, you know, and be inspired to follow in her footsteps. You know, it's incredibly important that we have these role models and what an absolutely amazing role model you know, it's working class, self-educated, amazing woman that did all these amazing things like 221 years ago. It's like it's just gobsmacking to me that she isn't all over our history books, you know. Um, very sadly, she died really young. She died of breast cancer in 1847 and she was just 47 years of age. And I just think, wow, you know, her life cut so short. What would could she have done? What would she have done, you know? if she'd have lived longer and yeah so incredibly sad that it was a quite a short life but such a packed incredible life as well um and then I just thought you know we get we don't really get asked this a lot but I just thought I'd quickly do this for you because I think this is a bit of an eye-opener and I think you'll enjoy this so why a statue why is a statue so important so this is just a UK thing but I think you'll like this so Believe it or not, in the UK, there are an absolutely staggering 85% of statues are of men and only 3% are of women. And, when, and what I'm talking about here are named men and named women. I'm not talking about Peter Pan or allegories or made up fictional. These are actual named men and women. That to me is shocking. And that hasn't really changed in nearly hundred years. 85% of statues, you know, what does that, tell our children and that what the importance that we place on men and women you know who are we putting on pedestals you know that that to me was a real shocker when when I found out about that and then when you dig a little bit deeper and then you realize that actually if you're Queen Victoria you take her out of it because you can't include queens because there's I think there's something ridiculous I think there's about 25 statues to Queen Victoria in the UK so we we, we don't include the queens because we take those out of the equation then when you take out the allegories, like I think this is um, peace and this is forgiveness and the famous scales of justice. Um, and if you're not a queen or you're not an allegory, then unfortunately, ladies, we're, we're depicted naked. And, th and that's about it, really. That's, you know, how we're seen in the UK. And I, imag I imagine that that's um, a Western global thing as well. I actually imagine that that's pretty much the same in any state in the States as well. Um, so it was really important to us that we wanted to kind of tackle that and, and, and try and change that balance a little bit. Um, and then when you dig a bit deeper, this you're going to absolutely kill yourself laughing at this. In the UK, right, in the UK, there are more statues of goats than there are of named women. Seriously, that is no joke. And then you dig a little bit more deeper, and this, is, this really makes me laugh, right? What are these, this is a bit of a quiz for you, what, what have these uh, statues got in common? It's not, I'm not going to kind of ask anyone to put their hands up. You probably don't even know. They're all kind of uh, British famous people. You might know the last one, actually. There he is. The one sat with his flowers in his lap. Yeah, these are all people called John. And there are more statues of men called John than there are of named women. So just some gobsmacking, unbelievable statistics in the UK. So that really needed to change as far as we were concerned. Um, this is a kind of a little quote that my daughter, this is what kind of spurned it all, you know, when she realized there wasn't a statue and I had to explain to her that working class women in Victorian times, you know, couldn't, you know, own their own property. They weren't, you know, seen as individuals. They were very much ruled by their fathers. And when they got married, they were ruled by their husbands. 
And this 10 year old girl looked me in the eye and she'd said this quote, and this is actually her first drawing that she did of how she wanted the statue to look. And she said, why, after all this time, is it not okay for women to be amazing mummy? And I just thought, I can't not ignore this and I cannot walk away from this. And so that was four years ago. And I'm just gonna catch you up with some images now. So this is where we're at. So we, and we did a artist competition with all the local school children in Lyme Regis. Uh, we had winners. We picked their artworks and they went towards helping Denise, who you can see here in the middle picture, uh, to create the statue. This is the artist maquette. So this is um, a 12 inch rendering of what the statue will look like. And this is kind of like um, a mock up so that everybody's happy with you know, what's in the statue, how, what's going to be in the statue and what it looks like before you physically go to the main one. And that was last year. And then she went on a bit of a tour. Everyone loved her. And then this year it's been mainly working. Oh, and this is the gang. This is part of the committee and some of the trustees um, with the maquette. This was a big day, actually. This was our maquette day when we launched her into the, into the world. Um, and we're really pleased. Everyone loved her. Um, and then now this is last month. So this is up at the artist studio. So this is our artist, Denise, and her partner, Rich, and the little dog, Willow. Um, and this is Mary. So this is Mary in the clay. So this has been sculpted by Denise. Um, and we just absolutely love her. You know, we've, we've kind of loosely based it on her portrait, but we wanted to, uh, the, the portrait is Mary depicted in a kind of her forties and was painted retrospectively. Um, so we wanted to have Mary at the height of her fame in her 20s. Um, so we've made her younger and more vibrant and energetic and athletic. And she's out striding out to the beach. She's going off fossil hunting. Um, and then the next um, uh, part of the casting, which is really interesting, she actually looks like a bit of a, a Madonna on that end one. Um, is that the clay is completely covered in a in a kind of a silicone um, before casting. It's, it's a really interesting process. So here you can see um, Jerry's painting the clay with a silicone and there's quite a lot of layers. And then the end picture, you can see just how many layers of the silicone goes on. And then all these like, little plastic fans that make her look like a Madonna, um, they, that's where all the, the um, gaps will be. So that's how she'll be cut up into sections. So she'll be more manageable and uh, being able to cast in, in bits. Um, so yes, yeah, so just a date for the diary before I wrap up. I'm not sure if I've gone over or I'm, I'm, I'm slightly under, um, but the big unveil date. So if anyone's coming over to the UK, um, we, we will try and live stream it on Instagram, but put this in your diaries anyway. So this will be on Mary's 223rd birthday, the unveiling on the 21st of May, 2022. And that's it from me. So I've just got um, any questions, if anyone's got any, that would be great. I can see there's some in the chat. Should I just open that up? And... Yeah, you can, if you want to open it, I can read them to you as well. Sorry, I have a cranky baby who's- That's all right. <laughs> I think so, we've got cranky kids tonight. Yeah, sorry, it happens. So, uh, Anne wants to know, where can we get that Mary Annie Rocks shirt? So I will share a link. Is to do it, can I share a link in here? Would that be the best way to do it? But yeah. actually, guys, if you just Google Mary Annie Rocks, you'll find our website and there's a link to our T-shirt shop there. So that's probably the best. Just Google Mary Annie Rocks and we'll, we've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Mary Annie Rocks. Everything's Mary Annie Rocks and you'll, you'll find us. Okay, Elizabeth wants to know, how did she earn a living? So from fossiling, from fossil hunting, that was her main source of, of, um, of living. So it was very, very hand to mouth. And if you can imagine, um, you know, it was the best finds and the best fossils were found in winter. So it was quite seasonal. So she would have to make and find and prep and, and, and sell enough fossils um, in, the, in the winter time to, to take her over the, the kind of summer period, really, when, it, when there wasn't that much to be picked on, on the beach. So yeah, it was, it was between her and her family, fossils was, was what put the you know meals on the table. Okay, here's another question. Um, how, do you know how big the ichthyosaur fossil that Mary first found was? Um, not 100% sure about measurements, but it wasn't as big as the one that I showed you. I think it was probably a, a, a fraction of that size, probably a third of the size of the huge one that I showed you, the Rutland dragon. Um, so it wasn't a huge one. It was a, quite a juvenile, I think, that they found. 
a bunch of questions just came in. They want to know where is the statue going to be placed and erected and, and how did you choose that place? So it's been a bit of a, I don't know if anyone's been following us on social media, but we've had real problems with um, tin pot councils and, and just lots of red tape and bureaucracy. So we've had three different um, places um, that have uh, one by one fallen by the roadside side by for whatever reasons. Um, but now, and I always believe that these things happen for a reason, um, because now we've got an absolutely amazing spot. So she is going out along the cart road. So if anyone knows Lyme Regis, um, the main fossiling beaches from Lyme Regis is, um, is, is Black Ven, and it's the old cart road. So it's the path that she would have taken from her house because the museum is on the original spot where her house was. Um, and the path takes you out from the town, out to the beaches. And it's just a really awe-inspiring spot because when you stand in the position where she's going to go and you look out to sea and you can see all the cliffs, all the fossil cliffs, it's actually the backdrop in the only portrait that we've got of her. So whoever painted the portrait used that spot or similar in that area to paint the backdrop. So it's got real synergy with, with the portrait of her. So we're, we're absolutely thrilled um, with the spot. Yeah, it's really fabulous. Awesome. Uh, someone wants to know how much would they have sold um, the frame fossils for? That question's from. Oh, for, well, in, in old money, peanuts, really, you're talking like 200 pounds, 50 guineas. You know, it wasn't, but I suppose if you then equate that to real time money, it would have been thousands, but still not not huge amounts of money um, because it was still a, 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 a um, an emerging science and it was still quite a niche uh, people that were looking at it as a science because geology was just kind of really becoming its own and paleontology was, was, wasn't even a thing, you know. That's why she's called the mother of modern day paleontology because it was because of, you know, the things that she did. Um, so they didn't sell for huge amounts of money, but enough for them to make a living and to put food on the table. But it was very, very hand to mouth and she struggled all her life with poverty um, right until her, de her death. Yeah, it was, it was really sad. Someone else wants to know if you created the illustrations that were that you presented in the talk of Mary Ann. No, I'm glad someone's mentioned those because because um, I come from an arts background and a lot of the um, people on the committee are graphics designers and um, we, we kind of reach out to a quite a creative uh, um, sort of ream of people, especially on um, Instagram. Um, and these are just people that we collected along the way who are illustrators who just love her and they'll say oh I've done an illustration of, of Mary and they'll send it to us or you know they'll, they'll tag us in on Instagram and then we'll use them and share them and it just highlights uh, just how many people out there love her and use her image and love drawing her um, and actually the people are asking about t-shirts when you go on our t-shirt um, shop there's one called um, uh, art, art, I think it's artists and it's all the artists that have um, that follow us and like us and they've created their own um, illustrations on t-shirts and some of them are absolutely beautiful so yeah have a really good look on the website because we've not just got like the logo t-shirts like that we've got all sorts of beautiful art um, t-shirts as well which look absolutely amazing that's great I I was looking at the t-shirts and I'm like I will be buying one of these <laughs> later <laughs> you know what our best selling one is the um, Joy Division one because it's Unknown Pleasures was the name of the uh, the album and we changed it to Unknown Plesiosaurs and then in the in the in the iconic waves of that iconic t-shirt we've put plesiosaurs leaping about in the waves and actually that's one of our best selling best selling t-shirts so yeah it's really funny great so someone wants to know if it's true that Mary had a pet dog that would fossil hunt with her. Yes, very true. She, we know for definite of one that was called Trey. Uh, she writes about him in a letter to Elizabeth Philpot because he actually got he he got killed in a landslide that nearly actually killed her when she was out fossil hunt, hunting. But um, he was called Trey, and he's actually in the statue. He will be included in in the, in the final piece. Um, but it's quite. Uh, we don't have any physical evidence of this, but it's quite easy to kind of believe this because a lot of uh, quarrymen used to do it. But if they found something of worth and they needed to get help or go and get extra tools, the dogs were trained to sit, a bit like kind of a hunt dog, to hunt and point at something. Um, so it's not too far removed uh, to believe that 
Trey was a fossil hunting dog and that he would help her and sit and mark spots if she had to rush off and go and get support from the quarry men to help her with a big piece. Because obviously those stretches of beaches can look quite similar and you kind of miss things in the mud. So yes, she did have a dog and we do believe that he probably did help a fossil hunt as well. Someone else wants to know if her father and brother also oh. fossil hunted with her. Yeah, so she learned everything from her dad. So her father was the kind of person who started the fossil hunting um, and immediately took the children out when they were old enough, as, as poor people did in the Victorian eras. Um, and they just learned their trade from their father. Um, eventually, Joseph did go his own way and he became a carpenter in his own right. Um, but Mary completely took over the business um, and, and opened the fossil shop in Lyme Regis and, and ran that. Um, and then when he died, she ran that with her mother. Um, and that was what she did for the whole of her life, yeah, was um, run the fossil shop and do fossil hunting. Great. Uh, someone wants to know if she ever had any children or family of her own. No, she never married. Well, not that we know of. There's no records of her ever marrying or having children. No, she was... Uh, she was married to her fossils. She loved what she did and that's, she committed her life to it. Great. Uh, she wants to know how far away from the collecting site did she live and does her house slash shop still exist? No, so unfortunately there was a huge landslide and, and uh, a lot of the properties along the front of the coast were lost. But the spot where her house was is where Lyme Regis Museum is. It used to be called the Philpot Museum. Um, and it's a fascinating place. It's one of those really cute little museums that's just packed, jammed with amazing things. So the museum sits on, on, on the um, sort of footprint of where her old house used to be. And literally, it was like a two minute walk. She should literally walk out of her door and walk to Black Ven Beach. Slightly longer walk, possibly she may have uh, used boats to get to Charmouth, which is the next bay along but she could get to the um, Lyme Regis um, coastline really, really quite easily. It was just a short walk. Great, so M. Smith wants to know, how did you choose what fossils rocks to put on the statue? Gosh, yeah, well, we I kind of let the children do it in a way, because all those adults were a bit like, oh, do we do this, do we do that? So why are we actually giving ourselves a headache? Let the kids do it. You know, the kids, the kids are going to be the ones that are going to be looking after it, because ultimately, I didn't, I didn't say this, um, that we're going to have, we're going to, as a trustees and a charity, we'll own the statue for the first five years, but eventually we do want to gift it to the children of Lyme Regis. And there's three key schools in Lyme Regis um, that we will gift the statue too so ultimately they'll be the, the keepers of her they'll be the caretakers and will look after her um so it made sense that they were involved in the kind of design of it so we just asked the kids what should be on there so we've got um, a plesiol paddle we've got uh, an ichthyosaur skull we've got lots of different belemites lots of different ammonites all kind of all that the classic um kind of things that you would find along the jurassic coast and um i'll let you into a little secret when we had the maquette day, and we've got a very fusty, um, strange mayor uh, called Brian. And he came to maquette day and we all, cause it was all COVID, it was all socially distanced. We all had masks on, so now we could see faces. And I was stood with the artist. I was stood with a represent, rep representative from the Georgia Association, like, like lots of really interesting people in the semicircle, all talking and the mayor came up. And he said that he was extremely disappointed that we'd included the dog in the, composition and I said uh we literally would have been hung drawn and quartered by all the children of Great Britain if we didn't include the dog the dog is like the dog's in a portrait the dog's part of a story she writes about a dog she draws her dog you, you couldn't have a statue of Mary without the dog it just didn't make sense to me and I think everybody thought he was kind of joking but I kind of know him he's he's not he's not a humorous man um and I just looked at him and I said, we just couldn't have this statue without him. Anyway, he walked off. And then the artist, um, Denise, said, do you know what? I think we're going to put a little copper light by the dog's paw at the back <laughs> as an ode to Brian. <laughs> so there is a little copper light on there as well. And that's the story behind the copper light. <laughs> that's hysterical. <laughs> uh, and very fitting because she worked with corporate lights a lot. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he said he didn't like the dog because they've got a dog problem on the beach. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's like, this is the kind of stuff, this small town 
tin pot yeah we've had a lot of that yeah, i think if yeah. we'd have been raising a statue in a big city like london or birmingham or manchester i think it would have been a lot straightforward but i think because it's a small town and even though evie lives 20 minutes away because she wasn't born in lyme regis she's considered an outsider honestly it's it's crazy pants it really is all right let's see if i have a couple more questions okay. lots of great questions coming in okay um, John wants to know, have schools participated in helping to fund your statue project? Um, they did individually. Some schools did like bakes. They did like Ammonite bake days. And, you know, the, the, when the kids did stuff and they raised money and then that money came into the crowd fund, that was the real lovely sort of drops of cash that I just thought that is so significant and so lovely. And not just because I've, I've, I've got kids of my own and they're so passionate about her. And I think it's important to mention as well that um, the national curriculum in the UK changed about four years ago. And she's actually actually physically named on the curriculum as part of um, teaching um, five and six year olds about geology and fossils. Um, and ever since her name was put on the curriculum, this this whole new generation of like kids that absolutely love her. I mean, we we have stickers that we produce and every time a school tweets us and say oh we're doing Mary Annie day and we're doing fossils we've made fossils out of pasta and we send them stickers and there's this real kind of the, the connectivity with children because they just really resonate with her story um so I've gone off track what was the question again sorry I've gone off on a on a wobble there uh, oh student yeah. kids helping fund the project yeah so definitely there was a lot of children that that helped definitely yes <laughs> sorry fussy baby again um okay. so other person wants to know, are there any other famous women you plan to promote after the Mary Anning statue? <laughs> I'm literally going to lie down in a dark room with the gin and tonic for about two years to recover because it's literally four years of my life. So I work full time. I've got two kids and I genuinely didn't think that it would be such a hard task to do. I genuinely thought that, you know, there is this huge, huge love out there for her. And we have what we call our Anning army. That support us but it was all the little it was the politics and it was the red tape and the rhetoric and the you know I mean I, I there was a certain person that actually said uh, we reached out for support and help when we first started and he called his team into his office and told them not to get involved with that woman and her kid because what did they think that they could do that 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 and that's just an example of some of the really horrendous negative uh, feedback that we got from some organizations that we really thought would reach out you know and help us um so that was hugely disappointed but in a way I thank I thank that man because that was a red rag to a ball for me and I think once I heard that feedback that that's what he'd done I thought right I'll show you what this bloody woman and her kid can do you know so it was a it was a real rocket for me um but yeah I but, but saying that joking aside um because we've had so much publicity around this campaign, there, there is actually a spin-off group that we've got called um, Visible Women. And there's 15 campaigns now across the UK, including Ireland. Uh, we've got the Dairy Girl, the Factory Dairy Girls statue, and yeah, 15 separate statues to forgotten women of history, all different campaigns at all different stages, all happening in the UK. And we all come together monthly. And we're a bit kind of like um a support group so because we're all at different stages someone can say oh how did you get planning permission or how did you get charitable status or how did you select your artists so it's this wonderful think tank that we can sort of reach out and every month we get a new person saying oh I want to raise a statue to such and such a body in my town and we're like join the club come on ladies join the gang you know so there is the spin-off group called um, Visible Women, which has been brilliant. And we hope that that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Because I'm sorry, 3% isn't good enough. We want at least 50-50. <laughs> Great. A lot of people thanking you for your presentation and saying <laughs> thanks for all your hard work on this. I have two two more questions for you, then we'll yeah. let you go. Um, so someone wants to know if she sold any of her pieces to scientists and where some of her pieces that she found are today. Yes, so she did sell a lot of them to scientists and then those scientists sold them on to quite impressive collections. They are all over all over the world. I think um, there are some of her fish actually in, um, oh gosh, what's the uh, museum in New York? Um, 
American Museum of Natural History. Yeah, I think there's some pieces in there that are hers. Um, but unfortunately, even though quite a few years ago, it was agreed by all that any of her specimens that could be proven and tracked back to Mary should now include her name, not the names of the rich men that bought them from her. There are still, especially in some of the museums in, in Paris, there are still specimens of hers hanging on walls that still don't have her name attached to them. Um, so you might actually be looking at something that she did collect and find, but just because her name's not on it, you wouldn't know. But if you really want to see a spectacular uh, kind of a, a portfolio of, of, of what she collected, then it's definitely the, the London Natural History Museum because there's a whole wall of her things and it's just absolutely gobsmacking. So that would be the best place to go. I can see someone's mentioned something about Tracy Chevalier. So Tracy's our, one of our patrons as well. And I read that book when it came out in, two, was it 2009? It was a long time ago, I think. Um, and I'd lived in this area and I, I love fossils, been fossil hunting since I was a child. I'd never heard Mary's name. And it wasn't until I read Tracy's book in a book club and I was absolutely blown away that this woman lived like a couple of miles down the road and I'd never heard of her. So it was, it was Tracy that kind of like introduced me to um, Mary Anning. Um, and unfortunately, Tracy did have the, uh, the, the, the rights to a film, um, but then nothing ever happened. It never got off the ground. Um, and the, the recent film, Ammonite, beautifully shot, obviously amazingly acted. I mean, Kate Brunswick could act her way out of anything. She's just an amazing actress. Um, but very, very little about Mary Anning and who she was and her finds. So uh, if you want to watch a beautiful, evocative, you know, the landscapes, you want to get a good look at what Lyme Regis and the Jurassic Coast is like, then definitely watch it for that. But you'll not come away thinking, oh, wow, what an amazing woman. And she did this and she did that because it's, it's not that kind of a film. Great. This has been wonderful. <laughs> We've taken up enough of your time. So thank you so much again for saying yes on my Instagram message I sent you. Yes. <laughs> I'm one of your across the pond followers. So we really, really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. So oh no, great. Yes, and everyone, please check out the project online. Support yeah, join us. us if, if you tweet. You can. <laughs> yeah, if you tweet, we're on Twitter. If your thing's Facebook, we're on there. We update regularly, especially now the statue is moving along really quickly. I'm almost every week showing a different stage of the process. Uh, we're on Instagram and we've got a website, got loads of information on the website. Join our mailing list. We send out a mailing list as well. Um, and we'll be sending out an event right soon to see um, who's coming along to the um, unveiling. So if any of you fancy jumping on a plane and joining us as well. well great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yes. And everyone, we will be back at 2.30 for our final talk. So join us in about 40 minutes. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>